Hello, my fellow resellers, and to those whom it may concern, my name is Jay Craft, an e-commerce seller of about 15 plus years and counting, and I'm here today to talk with you about the Shop Safe Act 2021 that's working its way through Congress or the Senate. It's on its way out to come disrupt some stuff for us everyday resellers. Uh, I'm a guy who sells variety goods online. I happen to do a little bit of e-commerce training here and there, and I sell a whole heck of a lot of one-offs, and I work with a wonderful community of other resellers as well, and we'll have some information about them later if you'd like to check them out. But I'm here today, and I haven't been here for a while. I haven't made too many videos because this bill or this act is a bit concerning for me. And I wanted to step through some of the things that are most bothersome to me. And I guess we'll just get started by asking, have you gotten the email from eBay? Are you part of eBay business or eBay Main Street? Are you plugged in with the politics of the bills that are, are coming out right now? And this has a lot of the same feeling and vibe that we had when the tax bills were really coming out. And there was a lot of pressure and a lot of concern and a lot of fear. And then they ended up getting pushed through and we're seeing uh, taxes on everything that we sell online uh, responsible through eBay. But there was a period of time where it was responsible through sellers and it created a, an accounting nightmare. And uh, when we saw that happen, we saw an increase in fees. But we're going to be talking about that here in a second. So I guess first question is, did you get the email that says, reminder, tell Congress to reject the so-called Shop Safe Act? And right off the bat, you can tell eBay has a, a, a clear stance on it, the so-called Shop Safe. They're not a fan of it. And then there's a quote here from an eBay seller, Patty W. It says, I thought the America Competes Act was supposed to be about helping American businesses, but if Congress includes Shop Safe, it will make it easier for big foreign companies to go after American small business owners like me, which is very, very true. Uh, this is why I'm taking the time to talk about it, because I've, I've stepped away from doing a whole lot of the eBay seller updates and the eBay news bits, because they just really haven't carried enough weight to warrant stopping, dressing, script writing, all of that stuff. But this is important. Now, now, the email continues on. It says, last week we altered or we alerted you that Congress is considered considering legislation that would make it hard to sell goods online. The so-called Shop Safe Act says that it is about protecting consumers from unsafe products, but in reality, the bill would put up barriers for small legitimate sellers while undermining tools and programs that allow marketplaces to go after actual bad actors. It would require sellers to submit even more personal information to online marketplaces, including government-issued IDs. We're going to talk about that. It puts a number of new burdensome verification requirements on sellers, even individuals just selling some used personal goods. Pits sellers against big brands, many of which are foreign-based with little U.S. presence, allowing companies to target individuals and get them permanently banned on from online platforms. This issue is actively being discussed in Congress, so it's critical to make your voice heard. Click now below and spend five minutes to reach out to your local representatives. Now, before I go any further, I wanna stress, I'm not an legal expert. I've read through the entire bill. I've taken a ton of notes. I've read through other commentary on it. I'm going to share all of my sources down in the comments or uh, down in the description, where I did my reading, where you can find the bill, uh, details on this, how to get in touch with me if you wanna talk with me further about it or if you have opinions that are different than mine. I'm gonna leave all the information down below so you can contact your representative. It's actually a pretty easy process. You press the button, you cycle through your representatives, you can leave a 60 second message, make sure you press the button at the end of the message or it does not actually get sent out to them and uh, really just harass them about this because this is important. OK, uh, this is really important and obviously be ethical about what you do, but they need to start hearing honestly thousands of people calling in. And let's be frank, we're really lazy about that. And part of that has to do with the political climate right now. Uh, there's quite a few people out there who don't feel like their voice is being heard. And then when their voice is being heard and they actually put their vote in and they get their representative, uh, their congressman, their president, whoever it might be, things might not actually go the way that they were promised it was going to go. And this is one of those things that's I, I'm like 99% certain it's going to get swept on through and no one's really going to talk about it. And it's not going to be an issue until a year from now uh, when the marketplaces run out of time to comply with these rules. And then what ends up happening is everything's going to go into effect and we're going to be like, how the hell did this happen? It's kind of like the restrictions and changes in regards to cryptocurrency that are going to be going into effect here soon and how... Uh, 
you know, these bills got pushed through during uh, a time of uh, crisis in Ukraine uh, and, and people were pretty much looking the other way or how, you know, the Hunter Biden laptop, uh, you know, confirmed a year later makes it to the 24th paragraph on, on, a, on a story uh, on New York Times and finally verifying that those things are true. So things are just getting swept along, swept along under the rug. But but here's the thing. It's not as cut and dry as eBay is putting it. And that's very important to understand. Um, and I don't blame eBay for not wanting to tell you like, hey, this is a big ass deal. You need to pay attention to what's going on here because your ability to sell in the future might be hindered, might be more expensive, or might be completely impossible. And I, I don't want to sound like a wild conspiracy theorist. I really don't. Okay. But there's a lot of things that are going on right now that are benefiting large companies. Okay. We've already seen... Uh, the economic impact over the last two years with coronavirus and just how much money has moved its way on up into big business and hedge funds and uh, investment firms and banks and pharmaceutical companies. And the last real hill that the independent consumer has is the free market. And that would be your eBay, your Amazon, Amazon, uh, Etsy, uh, Facebook Marketplace, Craigslist offer up. And this bill affects all of them. This isn't just going after eBay and Amazon. This is everyone. So I want you to buckle in and sit down, strap up, and we're going to talk about all of the things that are important in this. And we're going to go over some of the history of uh, what has happened in the past regards to copyright. We're going to talk about the bill. I'm going to give you some of my opinions OK, um, and and some of the scenarios and the ways that it could play out. And I, I, I don't care about the views. I'm not going to be turning on advertising for this video, but if, if you're, if you end this video and you're just a little bit worried, just share it with somebody. Okay. Just talk with somebody about it because you know what? I like reselling and I've done videos where I've talked about the death of a reseller before things like uh, increased costs. We have one coming up about inflation and about uh, packing supplies and just how much money are you making on a $15 sale or a $20 sale? There's a lot going on, but this could really truly be that death blow. And even if you have read the act, I would be, I would say, consider, consider listening to what I have to say on it. Okay. So, uh, I don't even know how you would describe this. It just says S one eight four three. I don't know if it's section or if that stands for something else. And it says to amend the trademark act of 1946 to provide for contributory liability for certain electronic commerce platforms for use of counterfeit mark by third party on such platforms and for other purposes, okay? And when it says uh, certain electronic commerce platforms, it means all, okay? Uh, with the threshold being half a million dollars every six months, uh, almost every platform, even the small ones, think of brands like Prairie Grit, we've talked about of them before, uh, they're, they're easily doing half a million every six months in gross sales uh, through there. Now, whether or not that means actual revenue to the brand, net or gross, or if it just means total volume of sales, that's still to be determined. It's not in the bill. Now, when it refers to the amending of the Trademark Act 1946. We're going to talk about that, okay? It was the, I have it here as the Lanham Act, uh, and you're going to have links for that as well. It says, was enacted by Congress in 1946, and the act provides for a national system of trademark registration and protects the owners of a federally registered mark against the use or similar marks if such use is likely to result in consumer confusion or if the dilution of a famous mark is likely to occur. Uh, so it says trademark eligibility, the two basic requirements to be met for a mark to be eligible to trademark protection, it must be in use in commerce and it must be distinctive. Okay. So you, you can't just have like s some little private label that's never seen light of day and have that be, um, have that be eligible for that. And now there's going to be some additional details and I'm not going to bore you, uh, uh, with, with all of it, uh, Yeah, no, I'm not going to bore you with all of it, but there there are cases that reference back to this um, often, just like with you know most uh, legal battles. So they'll reference back to this when it's an important one to know. Now it says the bill is to amend that trademark and to provide the contributor liability for certain electronic commerce platforms for the use of counterfeit marks. So 
what I'm worried about when I hear this is that it, and you'll hear me say this a few times, is that it's very, very broad. So when we talk about counterfeit marks, um, we, we have to ask, is that going to include everyone who's doing private custom creations? Okay. I know that there's people out there who will make like Nintendo themed shirts or the likeness of Disney or the likeness of your favorite sports team or your favorite cartoon character, or they'll take that trademarked character and they'll print it onto a coffee cup or, you know, uh, they'll, they'll put it onto a shirt. Now, obviously clear trademark infringement is an issue, but I have concerns with things like parody. Okay. And I have concerns with uh, likeness and stuff that would fall under fair use. And the, the reason I bring this up is because later when we talk about this, you're going to learn that the brands that have the power to actually press against eBay in regards to this uh, are v under virtually no real penalty for bringing it to eBay's attention that they have li listings that they have issues with. Now, we've already seen that with things like uh, the Vero system that eBay has in place. If you've ever sold anything by you know, Whammo, for instance, you know, if you sold a Frisbee or a slip and slide, you might run into resistance. If you've ever sold a onesie, there's a reason why that word can't be used. If you've ever sold, uh, uh what, you know, the as seen on TV ish, uh, items or, uh, the beach body items, uh, P90X, Rosetta Stone. These are all, you know, heavily protected trademarks and the trademarks companies will push really hard to try and resist counterfeits from being on the site, but they will also resist really hard because it protects the value of their brand. And we're going to talk about that more later too. Now, the other subcategory with this in regards to counterfeit mark or, or protecting the trademark would be things that are essentially like unofficial guides. Let's say, let's say you have the unofficial guide for Minecraft, but you're using the word Minecraft and you're using images and you're using the likeness of the product and you might somehow then dilute the value of the product there as well. So I see a lot of room for gray areas, lots of room for interpretation. And I'm not saying that every brand that I mention is going to be of the litigious variety. There's some brands that are pretty much ran their course, but as secondary market sellers on the open market, we should have the free and legal right to be able to sell any good that we legally possess to anyone else who is interested in legally possessing that good. And I will go as far as to say, um, there are, I believe there's even instances where counterfeit or reproductions, there's a little bit of room. So with the Nintendo market, you know, you have a thing called homebrew cartridges where people can make their own cartridges that are compatible on the Nintendo. And if you go way back when, there was lawsuits between brands like uh, Tengen and Nintendo as far as the legal rights for them to be able to have manufactured and made carts that were compatible for said device. Well, they're still making cartridges for the original Nintendo console. They're pretty dang neat. People are doing their own coding and creating their own boards. And would that pose an issue? To be able to say that's compatible for Nintendo. And let's be honest, Nintendo is a very litigious company. So it says counterfeit mark by third party on such platforms for other purposes. And I'm not even fully sure uh, what they even mean by other purposes. If you got an idea on that and you read through it, then let me know. It says, be it enacted by Senate and House of Representatives of the United States and Congress assembled. Section one, short title, the act may be cited as the stopping harmful offers on platforms by screening against fakes in e-commerce act of 2021 or the shop safe act of 2021. This rolls right off the tongue. Contributor liability for electronic commerce platform. It says platform liability, section 32 of the act entitled and act to provide for registration and protection of trademarks used in commerce to carry out the provisions of certain international conventions and for other purposes. And then we have a little bit more information there about the trademark act that we just talked about is amending by adding to the end the following. So it's going to take that existing 1946 bill and they want to tack this on to the end. They want to say basically, you know, hey, the online platform, the online world has changed a bit. Let's add this on to the end. And that's to the bill that I read to you earlier. Subject to subparagraph C, an, an electronic commerce platform shall be deemed contributorily liable in a civil action by the registrant for the remedies here and after provided for a case in which, without the consent of the registrant, 
A third party seller uses in commerce a counterfeit mark in connection with a sale. Offering for sale, distribution, or advertising of goods that implicate health and safety on the platform. So there is a ton to unpack here, okay? I'm gonna do my best for you. It's really hard even for me to fully understand exactly what I'm reading there, but I'm gonna do my best to break it down for you. Okay, so firstly, let's talk about health and safety, okay? What is health and safety in regards to online platforms? Well, we have our things that we're not legally allowed to sell, okay? They're just too gosh darn dangerous. And then we also have this, this really, really funky gray area, okay? Where we have items that are now known to the state of California to cause pregnancy and birth defects and harmful to around pregnant women. And it includes everything under the dang sun. If you don't believe me, go look up the list. We have these signs posted pretty much in front of every dang business here in California. And because I sell here in California, I have to put this disclaimer on my listing. And a lot of them have to have this Prop 65, uh, you know, little disclaimer for any item that I'm selling. I don't know if it costs me sales, uh, but it has to be there. And we're talking things like paint, coffee, uh, you know, certain certain types of metals within items. And, and here's the other thing, things that could implicate health and safety. We're talking pretty much anything, okay? Cosmetics, uh, jewelry, anything that touches the skin, anything that you would wear that would touch the skin, um, anything that could be, uh, you know, applied to a surface that, you know, might be something that could be harmful if inhaled. Uh, we're talking electronics and you're saying, how do you get to electronics? Well, we're talking about things that could be harmful to health and safety. Well, anything that has electricity running through it could potentially be harmful to your health and safety. Okay. Anything that uses batteries, for instance. Okay. So we're, we're talking a wide swath. And the, the idea is, and I've seen other bills do this before, where they have this really tiny, narrow, you know, on the surface look of things, but it's actually a much, much broader, uh, uh, you know, thing that they're going after. They're not just going after a single category. They're going after the whole shebang. And this is kind of their way to get the foot through the door. And here's the other part that I drew from that. Okay. Because it says the counterfeit mark in connection with the sale. So an item that you've sold. Okay. Um, offering for sale. I guess that would be an item that's listed online. Uh, distribution. So I, I guess that's just, you know, the process of just getting the item out to anyone. And then advertising of goods, advertising of goods. That's not even calling that a listing. That's not offering it for sale. That's just advertising that you have it. Okay. So let's say, and we're going to talk about Tiffany here in a bit. Okay. Because Tiffany actually went against eBay they had a court case and we're going to talk about that court case. So let's say I have a Tiffany bracelet and I want to sell my Tiffany bracelet. I would not be allowed to if it was deemed that uh, later on I'm unable to verify its authentic authenticity, or I'm unable to prove that it's not going to cause a health and safety concern because I can't verify its authenticity. And let's say, and here's the thing, let's say, and you'll see why I'm going to go here in a bit. Let's say Tiffany is the only company that can authenticate Tiffany goods. Okay. Because we have that problem right now with Vero. Okay. You sell a copy of Beachbody online and they come in and they say, nope. That one's not real. And okay, well, what do you do then? You email the company. You say, hey, jackasses, this is a real copy. I have a bill of sale. And they'll say, well, we can't verify that that bill of sale went to that item. Or you know what else they're going to do? Okay, just like, just like somebody who wants nothing to do with you, who has nothing to gain, they're just not going to respond back to you. So who else do you turn to for verification? So you'll see why this is so important later. So let's say you have a Tiffany bracelet and you say, I want to sell my damn Tiffany bracelet. I think somebody might actually enjoy it because, because you know what? I bought it for my ex-wife. I know a reseller who's done this professional, got a great channel. Okay. You buy her a damn Tiffany bracelet. And then a month later, she wants to break up with you. So you say, screw it. I'm going to sell it online. You're not allowed to list it. Okay. You're not allowed to offer it for sale and you're not even allowed to go to a website. And this is how they're really covering their base and saying, hi, I have a Tiffany bracelet. Here's what it looks like. And no price, no intent to sell, no like, you know, uh, 
you know, what, what, I don't even know what they call it. You know, like the, the, the wink, wink, you know, like they're, they're, you know, the, the, we kind of know why it's here. We, we know why it's online. It's like when you see people on marketplace and they're selling like a PlayStation three controller, but in the background, there's just piles of fireworks. It's like, Oh, I'm not saying I've got fireworks for sale, but you know, I mean, if you, if you're interested, so that's a little bit scary because that's a really, really wide swath. Okay. And now here's the last part of that, that implicate health and safety on the platform, unless the platform demonstrates that the platform took each of the following steps to prevent such use on the platform before any infringing act by a third party seller. And I believe there's 13 of them here. Okay. Or, uh, V I I eight, nine, I believe there's nine of them here. There might be, might be more. 10, 11, 12. Oh yeah, there's a lot of them. So these are the things that eBay must do <laughs> to prevent such use on the platform before any infringing act. Now, this isn't just eBay, Amazon, Etsy, Posh, Mercari, you name it. They all going to have to do it. Okay. And that, that's what's so, uh, that's what's so scary about it because there's going to be a lot of platforms that are just going to say, you know, we made enough money. We're just going to sell to somebody else and we'll let the whole thing fold or we'll just, we'll close it up right now. We're, we're good. We're fine. So determine after a reasonable investigation and reasonably periodically confirmed that the third party seller designated a registrant agent in the United States for service or process, or in the case of a third party seller located in the United States. And if the seller has not designated a registrant agent under subclause one. The third party seller has designated a verified address for service or process in the United States. So you must have an address, an actual address registered with eBay, verified through governmental identification or other reliable documentation, the identity, principal place of business, and contact info for the third-party seller. Now, this is a bit of a concern for me because a lot of people don't know this. eBay doesn't have your ID. Like, I don't know if it's been that long since you've registered, but they don't know everything about you. They don't even really know where you live. They only know where you've told them that you live, okay? None of that's verified. Your phone number isn't even really truly verified short of, you know, responding back with a pin code, but they don't know a whole heck of a lot about you. Even when managed payments became a thing too, you didn't even really give them your card information. So if this goes through, you're going to have to provide government ID to them. Now this might pose an issue for some people just for the simple fact that there's a, a fair amount of you out there. Okay. And I'll be honest, I've got my years where maybe you haven't paid all of your damn sales taxes. Okay. And you have them responsible every, for everything that you've done. And that poses a problem. Okay. Because the government's now going to be more easily able to locate you. And now I'm not saying that anywhere in this bill, it's implied that that's the reason that they're going to do that. The, the, the supposed reason that they're looking for that information is so that way uh, they can be able to track you down if you're the one selling counterfeit goods which sure sounds like a noble cause, but uh, what if you're the one who has been selling a whole bunch of Gucci bags in New York after the Gucci store got, you know, hit during the LA riots, you know, a year ago, year and a half ago when that whole shebang went down. Well, would eBay would have your contact information and your ID and they'd be able to connect the dots together significantly easier. And we've known we know this in the past that eBay has been forced to give up information in regards to uh, members on the site for legal reasons before in the past. It's something that does happen. Take reasonable steps to verify the authenticity of goods on or in connection with the registered mark in use and attest to the platform that the third party seller has taken reasonable steps to verify the authenticity of the goods under subclause one. So I have to take reasonable steps. I have to attest, which is like a, a, a certify, like I am, I am guaranteeing you, I am promising you, I am attesting that I have done said action. And I think that's going to push some of the liability back onto the third party seller. Because if I have a, you know, a galaxy phone and I say, I believe to the best of my knowledge that this phone is authentic, is that good enough? Now, with certain trademarks, it's it's going to be fine. With other trademarks, it might not be fine, okay? Because the trademark is going to have the opportunity to go after eBay as well as any other brand. And like I said, we live in a litigious place. At a certain point, eBay or another company, and we've seen eBay do this before, they'll say, we just don't want that business. 
it's just not worth it. We're getting sued too much. And they'll go ahead and shut down an entire um, a brand or a category, an item or whatever it'll be. They'll say, you know, we just don't want that business. Okay. It's very rare, but it can't happen. Okay. So the, the threshold for authentication might be much higher than a simple attestation. It might be, like I said, having to work with the brand. Imposed on the third party seller as a condition of participating on the platform contractual requirements that the third party seller agrees not to use a counterfeit mark in connection with the sale, offering for sale, distribution, or advertising of goods on the platform. So there was a period in time, I don't know if it exists anymore, where you could sell fake Rolexes, okay? Or you could sell replica coins. And I don't know, and I remember eBay would say, you know, the replica coins must have the R replica symbol on them. And if you're going to list a counterfeit Rolex, it must be clearly, you know, marked and indicated as being a counterfeit. Uh, and those types of things were perfectly fine. Uh, and like I said, if this p passes, your right to sell something that you legally own, even through like a Facebook marketplace, will be completely restricted. You can literally only sell it direct to consumer. And then from there, you know, I don't even know if you you would even be able to, you know, show pictures of your booth. Let's say you have a booth inside of a, of a store and be able to post that online because you might be uh, showcasing items that have counterfeit marks on them. So it's, it's going to be real interesting. The third party seller consents to the jurisdiction of the United States courts with respects to claims related to the third party sellers participation on the platform and designates a verified address for service of process in the United States. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that I understand that bit. I apologize. Uh, I, it, yeah, that's just a little bit too heavy for me right there. Maybe again, one of you guys can help me out. I did my best to try and digest as much of this as I could. Uh, here's the next one that's a little bit of a problem for me. Uh, is It says displayed conspicuously on the platform and for those of you who don't know, conspicuous, it means in a very clear and visible way, display conspicuously on the platform the verified principal place of business, contact in information, and identity, identity of the third-party seller and the country from which the goods will be shipped. Except the platform shall not be required to display any such information that constitutes the personal identity of an individual, a home street address, or personal contact information of an individual, and in such cases shall instead provide alternative verified means of contacting the third party seller. So I, I'm even a little bit twisted about this because on one end it's saying that the information must be displayed conspicuously and it's saying that it wants the, you know, the name of the business, it wants contact information. I don't know what other type of contact information you would have other than address, phone number, and name and the identity of the third party seller and the country that they're coming from. But then on the other hand, it's saying, um, you know, in other cases, and you know, you can provide all alternative forms and, uh, and they do not have to be required to display any such information that constitutes those things that you just said must be displayed conspicuously. So people have been making a fuss about this. And I'm not the first to talk about this. This is a thing that's been going on for about a year now. Uh, people have been making a big fuss in regards to how um, that type of information was going to have to be displayed on eBay. And if I have to be on eBay and if it's going to say Bolarama, Jcraft, and then have even my town visible. But if it has my town, if it has my phone number, God, my phone number has to be on there. I'm going to be so f freaking upset. And then even my street name, okay? I live on a street with like 30 houses. That's the only presence of this street in all of America. You cannot find this street anywhere else, okay? I don't want my street name on there. And now here's the thing, okay? I'm a small time seller. What if you do a million dollars a month? Okay. What if you deal in a niche item collectible and you're competing against like two or three other people and they don't like you? I've had to call the I've had to call the cops on uh, buyers and sellers alike, getting verbal threats, written threats, you name it. Okay, I've seen it all. I don't want any more of my information out there than I already have. I don't even put my real address on my damn packages. Okay, that's where I'm at right now in life. And it's, it has nothing to do with this. It's just you never know what type of crazy is out there in the world. And if eBay doesn't need my real address, why the hell am I going to give it to them? I'm not going to give anyone online anything that they don't need to have. Okay, so that's a big concern as well. 
It says, in each listing the country of origin and manufacture of goods, unless such information was not reasonably available to the third-party seller and the third-party seller had identified to the platform the steps it undertook to identify the country of origin and manufacture of goods and the reason it was una unable to identify the same. So I want you to imagine that you're going through your listing flow and the listing flow is already longer than it was five years ago, 10 years ago. And now we're going to make that field that says country of origin, we're going to make it mandatory. Now, I, I want you to imagine that you have, I don't know, like me, 1,500 items online and having to go back through and do your best to try and identify the country of origin of each one. And then on top of that, for each one that you're unable to, you're going to have to select that you were unable to and you're going to have to select the reason why. Maybe there's like two extra drop down menus that, that go along with that. I hate the idea of that because here's the thing. Who cares? Who cares where it was made? Is, is there really anyone? Like, here's the thing. I used to own a coupon book company in Fresno. I couldn't even get people to shop locally when I was giving them a damn coupon book that would pay for itself in like two coupons. Okay. And I would hear the same damn things of like, well, how come there's no McDonald's in here? I'm like, it's a, it's a coupon book for local companies. It features over 100 local businesses. I got it on my bookshelf back there, okay? People don't give a shit about where things are manufactured. And I, I'm sure you got that grandpa who has their belt buckles made here in America and they're proud of it, okay? But most people don't care. M most people, the one thing, the number one factor they care about is price. And then how quick can you get it to me? Because the whole world revolves around me and I want it to me now, okay? The country manufacturer doesn't mean anything. So these are just additional things that are gonna slow down the flow of business for all of us. It says required each third party seller to use images that the seller owns or has permission to use, okay? Which means that's the end of stock photos. And I am not a fan of stock photos, but I will say there's companies that have 50,000 books online, 100,000, million books. There's some companies that have over a million books online. They have no real photos. You have companies like Goodwill, all the different Goodwills. They use stock photos for all of their books, okay? They're going to have to go through and correct all of them or get permissions from every single publishing company, many of which don't even exist anymore, so you can't get permission, okay? So they're going to have to go through and just think about what that's going to do to the secondary market, okay? There's, there's... It blows my mind. We're already in a place right now where you're not allowed to steal stock photos. You just can't do it, okay? It's part of the, the copyright infringement program on eBay. And if you do it, you get in trouble for it. And if you haven't gotten in trouble for it, I'll tell you, it kind of sucks. I, I've only done it a handful of times when I've had items that were so big that I couldn't photograph them without laying them on the ground. And I'm, I just said, I'm gonna go get me a photo, okay? You can't, you, you have to have actual, images of the items that you're going to be selling because the idea is that this, gonna, this is going to help prevent counterfeiting. And you'll see here very soon why that's not the case. Moving on, it says, implemented at no cost to the registrant, reasonable proactive technological measures for screening goods before displaying the goods to the public to prevent any third-party seller use of a counterfeit mark in connection with a sale, offering for sale distribution advertising on the platform. So how does eBay go about implementing something new? I, I know eBay has tools in place already. They have a thing called the fraud engine, which works to try and detect counterfeit listings based on a handful of factors, but they're gonna have to go further and they're gonna have to use like smart image technology to try and detect counterfeits. What this is probably going to mean, it's probably going to mean that people aren't going to be able to clone photos and people aren't going to be able to steal photos off manufacturers' websites. It's going to probably use some type of Google reverse image search to try and locate other instances of said photo. You might even see third-party tools come to the marketplace to help people get around this. I mean, it wouldn't be too, too hard to do. Uh, but then we also have Vero, which is the Verified Rights Owners Program, which both of those two things together, they do a pretty darn decent job because what it does is it keeps the liability on the brands to say, hey, if you see fake stuff, just, just let us know. That's all you have to do, okay? Now, I understand there, there's two sides to this. 
there's a side where I agree with the brands. And then there's a side where I agree with eBay. And this is the tricky thing. I agree that the liability shouldn't fall on the brand to have to, to police the entire internet for anyone selling fake stuff online. And that the brand should, with reasonable with reasonable efforts, do everything in their power to make it uh, accommodating for the brand to be able to take proactive steps to be able to, you know, take items down or to be able to uh, work to get really bad actors removed from platforms. Okay, that makes sense. And I don't feel that the brand should have to burden the cost of that. But that's just the real fucking world. Okay, because if it's not online, where is it going to be? It's going to be out on the streets. You can walk down the streets of L.A., you can walk down the streets of New York, and you can buy any counterfeit handbag you want. Okay, Now, the responsibility there, I mean, that, that again falls on somebody different. Who, who is supposed to regulate those types of activities? Because we already have people regulating it at the, uh, the ports when the items come in, trying to stop the flow of it happening there. But I see the point. Because there are certain instances where eBay does turn a blind eye to a lot of things. And we're going to talk about some of those examples here moving forward. But at any time, any registered brand owner can go on and they can go bloop, 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 bloop. And I can even show you guys the tool. Okay, I, I have a similar version of it. You can yank down or you can report. But with the Vero tool, you can yank down hundreds, if not thousands of listings at a time uh, that you have issues with. And then the notices just get fired out to every single person out there. So the tools are there, they just have to burden the cost because that's kind of the reality of it. And asking the platforms to do even more than they're already doing, it's gonna create some unintended consequences unless they really know what they're doing and then they're, they're, actually, trying to, uh, they're actually trying to push their weight around. So we need to talk about Tiffany versus eBay Inc. I'm gonna be reading to you from the wiki article because it's the most concise concise breakdown of it. And we're talking about Tiffany, the jewelry company. It says, uh, Tiffany Inc. versus eBay Inc. is a United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit case in which the plaintiff Tiffany and co filed the complaint first in 2004, alleging that eBay constituted direct and contributory trademark infringement, trademark dilution, and false advertising since it facilitated and advertised counterfeit Tiffany jewelry on its online market. On July 14, 2008, the District Court for SDNY decided in favor of eBay on all claims. Tiffany appealed these decisions to the second court. The court affirmed the judgment on the District Court with respect to the claims of trademark infringement and dilution. The false advertising claim was returned to the District Court for further processing, which was then ruled in favor of eBay. So we're talking about that 1946 copyright laws getting pressed to court by Tiffany and eBay, and eBay winning on all counts. It says, in May 2003, Tiffany, a com uh, Tiffany complained to eBay regarding the sale of counterfeit items on its website, and eBay recommended Tiffany participate in Vero. In 2004, and again in 2005, after litigation ensued, Tiffany conducted surveys to determine the extent of counterfeiting occurring on eBay. Tiffany hired a third party to purchase a random sample of items bought from eBay using keywords Tiffany and Sterling and then inspected these items for authenticity. 136 pieces were purchased in 2004, 73.1% of which were counterfeit, 5% were authentic, and the remaining 21.9% were unverifiable. 139 items were purchased in 2005, 75.5% of which were counterfeit. So... I really want to hammer on this because I brought it up earlier. Tiffany, the manufacturer of Tiffany Sterling jewelry, uh, was only able to verify uh, somewhere in the area of 5% of their jewelry is being authentic, 73% is being counterfeit, and 22% is unverifiable. So here's the thing, and I've talked about this before. Okay, uh, If you make a counterfeit so good that it is indistinguishable from the real thing, guess what? It's the real thing now. And I don't care what it is, okay? Uh, if you have, oh, here we, we'll, let's say this, this avocado right here, okay? That's a Jelly Cat avocado. Now, you can go on AliExpress and you can buy a Jelly Cat plush, an avocado plush, that's identical to that one, okay? Same materials, 
same fabrics, same stuffing, same density. It's an identical piece. It just doesn't have the tag on it, okay? Pretty much the manufacturers overseas, they'll make, you know, 10,000 units for the Jelly Cat brand, and then they'll go ahead and run off like another 1,000 more and sell them under some no-name brand on AliExpress. You see this with every product under the sun, okay? This, this is how the problem starts. Now, if the additional units that they make are indistinguishable from the real thing, which why wouldn't they be any different? The only difference is they don't have the little butt tag on them because they're, they're obviously not gonna make identical counterfeit units, but they're missing that or they'll sell the plans to another company and the other company will produce a counterfeit or they'll just buy one and then reverse engineer the damn thing, which it's not hard to do. And they'll make their counterfeit and then they'll start selling those. So if it's indistinguishable, guess what? It's the real thing, okay? If you put two next to each other, look at them under a microscope and they're the same thing, both are real now. That's how it works in this world. So if Tiffany is unable to determine if their items are real, okay, what do you think the odds are of you being able to reach out to Tiffany and trying to get them to verify one of their own pieces? Okay, Because we have between their pieces that they were unable to verify and the pieces that they were able to verify, that's 26% of them, okay? They can say with certainty a bad fake, okay? But let's be clear too, they weren't searching for authentic Tiffany jewelry. They typed in Tiffany and Sterling. This wasn't chance, okay? There's probably some Tiffany inspired Sterling silver style bands in the likeness of authentic pieces. It's clearly fake, clearly, clearly wordplay, okay? But they, they just grabbed the hodgepodge. Moving on though, after counterfeit items continued to be sold on eBay, Tiffany made five different demands of eBay in June 2004. Now I want you to keep in mind, this is Tiffany demanding eBay to make change. In court, they're saying just make these damn changes and we're, we'll be fine. Now obviously they didn't, <laughs> they didn't get their changes, okay? Uh, but now it's the government coming in and saying, make these changes. The benefits and things that a major nationwide corporation wanted to happen to e-commerce platforms is now being imposed on them by the government. And we, you know, again, call me conspiratorial, but you would almost think that the government has big business in mind, like they're like in their back pocket or something, and that maybe they're somehow have like a vested interest to see to it that you know, small time sellers who are selling things on the secondary market to keep their head afloat during a global pandemic, uh, you know, it might be time to go ahead and just stop the last of that and help out big businesses. So they call me crazy though. The first demand prevents sellers from listing five or more Tiffany jewelry items at once. Ban the sale of silver Tiffany jewelry. Ban the sale of items advertised as counterfeit Tiffany. Stop advertising the availability of Tiffany merchandise. And five, remove the Tiffany sponsored link advertisements on search engines. Although eBay continued to allow the sale of Tiffany jewelry and buy sponsored links advertisements through a third party, eBay's refusal to categorically ban sellers listing more than five Tiffany items at the time triggered the lawsuit. So the first one makes sense, not gonna happen, okay? Banning the uh, five or more items. Banning the sale of silver Tiffany jewelry, nice request, not gonna happen. Ban the sale of items advertised as counterfeit Tiffany, it kinda makes sense, not gonna happen either. And then stop advertising the availability of Tiffany merchandise uh, and buying sponsored links. Uh, go eBay, that's pretty damn savage that they were buying links and putting them on Google to let people know that they could go there and they could buy Tiffany jewelry. I really like that. I really do. On July 14, 2008, the district court ruled in favor of eBay on all issues. Tiffany appealed in the second court, and we talked about this, and they lost that appeal as well. eBay's use of the Tiffany's mark, uh, Tiffany pointed out that eBay advertised the availability of Tiffany goods on eBay Marketplace through several ways, such as on the eBay homepage, through communications with sellers and buyers, and through a list of top search terms and popular brand names. From this, the court ruled that eBay's use of the Tiffany mark on the website did not create the impression that Tiffany had affiliation with itself, sponsored or endorsed the sale of the Tiffany items, and that the eBay's use of the Tiffany's marks on its homepage was a protected nominative fair use. 
So that eBay demonstrated that it's necessary to use the Tiffany marks in order to identify and describe their jewelry. eBay demonstrated that it did not use the marks more than necessary to identify the item. So that eBay showed that it did not do anything that would suggest Tiffany & Co. was sponsoring or endorsing any listings on eBay itself. Very, very interesting stuff. It's important to know that. And you'll see, you know, I've kind of given you some case examples already. But as we move forward, uh, understanding those things is going to help a bit. Reasonable awareness, and we're going back to the bill here, reasonable awareness of use of a counterfeit mark may be inferred based on the information regarding the use of a counterfeit mark on the platform generally. General information about the third-party seller identifying characteristics of a popular listing or circumstances as appropriate. A platform may may reinstate a listing disabled or removed under this clause if, after an investigation, the platform reasonably determines the counterfeit mark was not used in the listing. A reasonable decision to reinstate a listing shall not be the basis for finding that the platform failed to comply with this clause. So if you do have issues, if you're, you know, potentially using a counterfeit listing and that listing gets removed, uh, tell me once in the history of eBay when you've had a listing removed that you've seen it get reinstated again. I've had it done once and that's only because I'm concierge, but it's very, very rare to ever see such a thing. Now, Implementing a policy, this is one of those 13 things I was talking about. Implementing a policy that requires termination of a third-party seller that has reasonably been determined to have engaged in repeated use of a counterfeit mark in connection with the sale. Offering for sale, distribution, or advertising of goods on the platform. Use of a counterfeit mark by a third-party seller in three separate listings within one year shall be considered repeated use except when reasonable mitigating circumstances exist. So this again, this is a rule that the government is trying to impose on private business. Now I understand things like eBay and Amazon are damn near, you know, up there with cable TV and internet as far as, you know, public public commodities as far as I'm concerned. Okay. And I understand that some form of regulation is going to be necessary, but how do you have government telling eBay and Facebook and Amazon that if somebody tries to sell a fake item three times online within a year and we can prove it and you're the way, well, hold on, you're the one who needs to prove it. If you can prove that somebody has tried to do this three times in a year, you must ban them for life. They are no longer allowed to uh, sell online if that happens. Now, I can, I can appreciate if the government wants to suggest eBay, please, please do some work to help us fight the fight against counterfeiting. Here's some suggestions we would love to see. Please play ball with us. If you play ball with us, maybe we can work with you on something else. Okay, maybe we can help you in whatever way. But to to put it, bundle it into a bill that again benefits big business, other big businesses, not that big business, uh, makes no sense to me at all. It says a platform may reinstate a third-party seller if, after an investigation, the platform reasonably determines that the third-party seller did not engage in a repeated use of a counterfeit mark or that the reasonable mitigating circumstances existed. A reasonable decision to reinstate a third-party seller shall not be the basis for finding that the platform failed to comply with the clause. All of these things are expensive. That's the thing that bothers me is that they're going to have to pay for new tools to detect items. They're going to have to pay for new people to uh, arbitrate and determine whether or not you intended to sell a counterfeit good, if you have a history of selling counterfeit goods, uh, pulling down and reinstating listings, uh, going through and talking to people who have had their accounts banned. Because here's how, here's how quick it can happen. Okay, I, I don't think some of you really understand like just how fast this can be a problem. You have 1,500 items online, none of which you have verified as being authentic to maybe whatever the heck eBay standard is. And I've seen things that you wouldn't even freaking believe, okay? I've seen books, textbooks, counterfeit ones, counterfeit plush, we were just talking about that, okay? Pretty much everything on this shelf can be counterfeited, okay? I've got vinylmations, there's counterfeit vinylmations, counterfeit Pokemon products, those Pokemon plush, those are regularly counterfeited. Video game, I got video game controllers over here, cell phones, fake cell phones, okay? You take your items at face value, you look at them and you believe them to be genuine. You can have within your 1500 items, 
you could have one company that represents, let's say I have Disney, I have 300 plus Disney items. And Disney can come in in one swoop and say, uh, we believe that, that five of these items of yours are counterfeit. We have reason to believe it. And then boom, into the investigation and query process we go. And if I have three open investigations, that might be grounds to place me under suspension while the investigation's going on. And let's say, heaven forbid, I did screw up. Okay, let's say I have custom vinyl nation. Ah, I found some examples for you. So for those of you who don't know, vinyl nations are three and a half inch tall uh, vinyl figures of different popular characters through the Disney franchise. And then they also have some other artistic ones. Now this is what a standard one looks like. And this could be counterfeit. It really could. There's ways you can tell. You can pop the head off. You can look for marks underneath of the head. You can check the quality of the print and everything like that. And uh, But eBay could say, you know what? We have reason to believe this is counterfeit. There's an autograph on the back. That worries us. That's not one of our marks. So we're a little bit worried. We're going to go ahead and open up a claim against this one. And uh, then you also have this one online. Uh, yeah, we didn't produce that. Uh, that's not one of our pieces. Uh, you know, this is definitely counterfeit. This is not an official Disney piece. Well, this is a custom paint job over a piece, and it's signed by the artist at the bottom. Is this something that they could open up a claim against me on? And I know that just seems like so, like, such an extreme example. It seems so dumb that that, that would be something that I might need to worry about. But it truly could be a problem. And I think that the fact that everything is so broad leaves it in a place where we, we would have to worry about stuff like that. And I could see eBay issuing statements and saying like, hey, here's some of the things that we're worried about. These are some of the categories that we think we might be encountering some problems with. And these are some of the things that you should do to ensure that your account stays okay. It's a little bit scary. So let's say you do get banned off the platform. <laughs> Oh man, it says a platform may reinstate a third party seller if after an investigation, the platform reasonably determines that the third party seller uh, did not engage in repeated use of counterfeit mark or that the reasonable mitigating circumstances exist. A reasonable decision to reinstate a third party seller shall not be a uh, basis for finding that the platform failed to comply to this clause. So here's the thing, let's say and we've had this happen before. I've, I've been suspended a few times off eBay. I've never been fully expelled, but I've been suspended a few times and I've been suspended in error even, okay? Your revenue just stops instantly. There's no more money coming in off eBay. I'll tell you when these, these suspensions start rolling out and these bans start rolling out, it's not gonna be a quick process because uh, there will be an overwhelming presence of force by brands who are gonna be emboldened with power for the first time ever. And it's not just gonna be Tiffany going after eBay. It's gonna be the top 500 commerce brands online. And they'll all be going after eBay with a crushing force that you cannot even imagine. It'll be enough to bankrupt the company if they so choose. And I mean, why wouldn't you? If you were Disney and you could say, well, for the first time ever, we have the power to control the secondary market. No one online can sell Disney, except for us. Who wouldn't take that? Who wouldn't take that opportunity? I mean, you, if you give somebody an opportunity to, to have superpowers, it's like, today you can fly, if you so choose. I, I think I will. I would really like that a lot, okay? So if you could control the flow of your goods in one direction and one direction only, it goes from you to consumer and stops, except for local sale, but that might be a problem too down the line, okay? Because you're advertising your goods. I, I'll tell you, it's going to continue to reach further and further. So when the bans start happening, if this bill passes, uh, you're, you're not going to be able to get back quickly. And if you do get back, uh, I wouldn't even continue to hold your breath because if you've been targeted once, you'll probably be targeted again. Uh, and it doesn't take much bad press. I mean, imagine if 10% of eBayers just stop making revenue. Uh, and you also have to think about how delicate the eBay e ecosystem is. They're not making massive margins right now. They're running on razor thin margins and have been for like a decade, okay? Um, you know, they, they, they spend way too much money on things that they shouldn't have to spend money on, but that's the cost of doing business here in America. 
it's going to be rough if that starts to happen. And th that's why I took the damn time to make this video for you today. And I apologize for running so damn long. I'll try and get through some more of this, but we can talk about more later if you want. Implemented at no cost to the registrant, reasonable technological measures for screening third-party sellers to ensure that sellers who have been terminated do not rejoin or remain on the platform under a different seller identity or alias. And I just want to note that this already exists for most platforms. eBay, Amazon, Facebook all have features like this in place that regard uh, IP tracking and just, you know, to verify that people are who they say they are and that they're not trying to circumvent those things. Provide a verified basis to contact a third-party seller upon request by a registrant that has a bona fide belief that the seller has used a counterfeit mark in connection with the sale, offering for sale, distribution, or advertising of goods on the platform, except that the platform is not required to provide information that constitutes a personal identity, home, street address, yada, yada, yada. We went through that. Okay. Um, the counterfeit mark has meaning given to them in section 34. The term electronic commerce platform means any electronically accessible platform that includes publicly interactive features that allow for the arranging of sales, the shipping of goods, or enables a person other than the operator of the platform to sell or offer to sell physical goods to the consumer located in the United States. The term good, goods that implicate health and safety means goods to use of which can lead to illness, disease, injury, I mean, I can hurt myself with almost anything, serious adverse event, um, allergic reaction, oh man, I live in California, we will sneeze at anything, or death if produced without compliance with all federal, federal applicable state and local health and safety regulations and industry desi designated testing safety quali quality certifications, manufacturing, packaging, and labeling standards. Labeling! You label your item wrong. Mm -mm. Nope. God damn. This is so broad. That's the problem. This paragraph shall apply. Now, the next two paragraphs, I'm just going to leave them on screen while I'm talking. Just go read them for yourself. It refers to small marketplaces. The, the problem, though, is that it's like we're talking about people who do half a million dollars a year or under, and that's within a six or half a million under six month period, with the exception of people who have gotten 10 of these. Um, NOCs, NOICs, notice of item of or NOCs, notice of counterfeit items. If you get more than ten of them, you no longer have that immunity from being a small commerce platform. You're just right up there with the big boys again, and you're uh, you're going to get scrutinized the same way. Uh, pretty much all small platforms will be gone. So if this happens, just say goodbye to. And I don't want to. Don't quote me on this, but I I would strongly worry about brands like Prairie Grit uh, at the small volume not being able to handle the le le legal and logistic burdens that would come with stuff like this. It would basically make it impossible for any new competitor to ever step in the marketplace against brands like eBay and Amazon. There would just not be enough money in the world to start a brand new company, uh, even if you had all the angel investors you could think of, because this barrier to entry would make it almost impossible. That's what this really is, okay? We really need to think critically about what's going on right now. And the idea is that the, this whole bill is to stop the flow of counterfeit goods into America or even ones that are being made or sold here. Uh, the idea that this will protect companies and encourage creatives to work on new inventions without fear of being hijacked a month later. So what that means is I was watching the CNBC thing and they said that, you know, these people who create brand new inventions or brand new ideas, they make them and they put all this money into time and tooling and everything. And then like a month later, uh, you know, the, the Chinese people will knock off the product and then they'll start selling it on Amazon. And in turn, there goes all the sales of the primary product because they don't even rank well anymore. They stop getting sales after a month. Okay. Is that my fault? No. Sure, sure as hell is not your fault. Are you buying the counterfeit goods and selling them? No. It's the people in China. Okay? They, they can't afford that many freaking middlemen along the way. It's the people who are manufacturing the goods. That's the real problem. It's the people who are packaging the goods up and then sending them to our country. It's the fault of all the people who do not intercept those packages the entire way here. It's the people who see really suspicious activity happening domestically and they're doing nothing about it. It's the fault of companies, and I'll even point my finger at eBay, who work to onshore goods like Orange Connex and not do proper vetting of those goods. It's not my fault that some jackass is selling counterfeit cell phone cases on eBay or on Amazon. I don't care about any of that. 
don't screw up my marketplace because other people are making mistakes. You're throwing out the baby with the damn bathwater and there's no reason for it. I understand that there is room to make the marketplace better. Okay, Offer guidance and offer support. Offer tools. Get these Get these different entities talking with each other. Don't impose overbearing uh, policies with the aim to, to try and correct things without really understanding the implications to everyday people like me and you. That's all you got to do. Really look at who it's going to hurt. And as I said, even if eBay does pull through this, and let's say this just does happen and this is the way it's going to be, it's going to cost everyone more money and it's going to cause a lot more headaches. And it's just going to make this whole thing that we do not worth it even more. And I've already had my bouts of like, I don't know what I should do with my life. And I don't know if I want to keep reselling or I think I could do something bigger than what I'm doing currently. You know, the tax liability and you know, the, the issue selling certain items during the pandemic, which I was already against, um, and just all of this crap that's going on, it's just really hurting the American people. Um, it's, it's painful to see. I really hope over the next couple of years we can get people into office that will actually listen to the American people and uh, hear us and make changes that are truly beneficial to the masses and not beneficial to the few, which is what we've been seeing going on for far too long now. Republican and Democrat, both sides of the aisle. Um, things have to change. If you enjoyed this, uh, there's a blog that I want to direct you to. It's blog.ericgoldman.org. And he did a massive teardown on this, and I want to thank him for some of the information that I gathered from there. And his information, as well as the bill, is going to be down below. So check it out. And then the last thing I want to leave you with is some of you may know that we've had a group chat on Facebook and it was like 20 bucks a month and you can interact with me and some other sellers and all that good stuff. Well, we've changed it. Okay. And now it's free. It's completely free. Okay. You want to go check it out. We have a discord now. The link's going to be down in the description. If you don't know what a discord is, okay, let me know. I still plan on making a training video to help some of you guys out getting over to discord, but it's an online chatting app. The application is free. You can download it and then you can join our server. They call them servers. It's a chat room essentially. And you can talk with us. We have general reseller stuff in there. Uh, and then we do have an extra option. It's cheap as chips, guys. It's five bucks a month, five buckaroos. And you get to learn about bolos. You get to learn about offers and promotions. We had like free donuts last week. We had a bolo homeboy talked about. You make like $500 on a single damn bolo. We had a couple hundred dollar bolos. We have a chat room for crypto and finance. We have a chat room for all kinds of junk on there. Okay, so if you want to interact with some other cool resellers or if you want to go in there and you want to yell at me and tell me why your president's better than mine, come on in. Okay, we'll be there. We'll, we'll do it. Okay, it'll be a fun time. Um, but yeah, hope to see you there. Thanks for watching. Remember, if you don't make that money, someone else will. Have a great day.